All right, so we'll get started in just a couple more minutes. Please feel free to use the Q&A box or chat box. And if you want to be unmuted to ask questions, feel free. Um, it's not a large group of us tonight, so we can make it more like a meeting if you'd like. Just let us know um, any questions you have, anything you've thought of before. And we'll get started in just a minute. And my right hand man, Nicole, just shared the uh, recent e regulations. And you can find any of our guides on eregulations.com backslash Nevada. And the phishing link is in the chat. And you can open that up. And that gives you all the state, um, all of our state rules and regulations, including maps and where certain fish are in the waters and um, any like not fishable waters like the wetlands park down here in southern Nevada or certain parts of the Truckee River that are off limits. All that is on there. Play this one more time and then we'll get going. So a little taste of Mojave was our intro video there. I'm joined with Nicole Hamlin, who's our volunteer coordinator, Claire Clark, who is an outdoor enthusiast and our seasonal AmeriCorps for the year. And my name is Abby Zarnecki, and I am a Southern Nevada native and have been fishing since I can remember. Um, Eagle Valley was a big family trip for us growing up. Um, and fishing for trout. And uh, just a couple of years ago, I became the Southern Region Angler Education Coordinator for Nevada and have traveled all over the Southwest. Um, so this is a family program, it's rated PG. Thank you for joining one of our programs. I recognize some names from other of, um, of our programs too. So nice to see you again. Also, um, uh, we will have the chat and the Q&A features open for you. We'll also ask you to unmute, but if there is any foul language or anything inappropriate, we will have to remove you from the program. So tonight we'll go over gear and equipment. Um, each of my co-hosts will go over some of their favorite parts of fishing and some fun stuff they figured out. Um, we'll go over some knots. I have some of my knot tying kits with us tonight and some um, of my favorite lures. Also, how to find those fish that have evaded us and to be prepared. And so all of that, um, this is a safe place. Feel free to ask all those questions that if the guys were around, you might be nervous about. So um, we'll make ourselves at home. All right, so welcome to the club. I think we're a little over this now, but um, around the last stats were from last year. 
We have over 17 million female anglers in the U.S. and climbing thanks to COVID and all of us got getting stuck at home and wanting to get out and to take a break from stress. It's the perfect way to get out of the house and away from our technology and um, especially in Nevada, finding those spots in between the mountains where there's no cell service. Um, you can connect with your family and friends. It can definitely be affordable. You can make it as expensive as you want. Um, and then uh, more and more manufacturers are recognizing the importance of women um, in fishing and boating. And that includes just we're social creatures and we have some of us have kids. And so they're finally realizing we're the ones taking the kids fishing. I know a couple of my friends um, I ran into at the park over the holidays uh, with their kids. So it's pretty neat to see everybody out and about all over the water. And this is a picture of a new angler right before COVID actually last year, um, her dad took her out and we fished with the junior bass club out of Boulder City. All right, Claire. All right, thank you, Abby. So we will be talking about our gear basics. Um, we'll talk about being comfortable in all different types of climates and throughout different seasons. And we'll talk about sun protection. And Abby, I think you're going to have to click through these for me. Uh, we'll talk about some of the different rods and reels that can be used when you're out fishing and the different line types that could be used. As Abby said, she'll go over some of the different knots that are commonly used and you'll get to see them demonstrated. We'll talk about lures and bait and how to choose those based on where you're at or what you're fishing. We'll learn how to find those fish in the different bodies of water that you might be fishing in. And then we'll wrap up with fishing and boating licenses. Now, most importantly, when we're out fishing, we just want to be comfortable. And this can be kind of tricky because um, especially if you're going to be on a boat, you're going to experience it chilly out on the water and all that wind whipping past you. But then when you're out in a spot, you're going to warm up again. <clears throat> and I ran into this last week when I was out on the boat. Kind of forgetting that it's going to be incredibly cold when you're zipping across the lake at night. Um, so layers, layers, layers. And you want to make sure that these are thinner layers that you can build up on, um, but also layers that are practical. So if you're going to be using long sleeves, and maybe this is even something like longer pants, um, consider getting some that will roll up and that have buttons or Velcro to help keep that up because we don't want those sleeves falling down or rolling down on us um, as we're casting or getting snagged on things. So if we can Velcro them up, um, then we can easily transition from like shorts to long pants or a short sleeve shirt to a long sleeve shirt. The mesh lined shirts can be really helpful um, especially with this kind of like climate control and if you're doing warmer weather fishing. And if you're like me, um, maybe you just sweat all the time, no matter if you're hot or cold. So these kind of like vented armpits are incredibly useful uh, so you don't get too much built up. When you have your pockets, be sure to check those and make sure that they either have zippers on them or some kind of Velcro uh, because we really just don't want all of our gear that we're keeping in our pockets to fall out. Uh, for hat, neck protection, and sunglasses, those are all very important, but I'll go into those more on our next slide. Now, I am a very pale person by nature, but I also come from a family basically riddled with skin cancer, and I've had it like terrifying me this whole time. So for me, sun protection is huge. And um, this may seem like overkill, so maybe just pick and choose a few that you want to start with. But I think for anybody, sun protection is crucial. We're getting it not only directly from the sky touching us, but all that light is going to be reflected on the water. 
Um, and so that's where some of these other pieces might come into play. Now, most of our clothing, um, I would say is either like cotton or like a polyester maybe. And it is physically covering your skin, but it doesn't really offer much protection against those UV rays. So I would consider uh, looking into UV protective clothing. And this is just clothing that is specially made for keeping you out of the sun. <clears throat> now, when you have sunscreens, you'll have like SPF 30 or SPF 50. It's kind of similar in clothes, uh, but they use UPF. So if we had a rating of UPF 50, this means that only 1 50th of those sun rays are actually getting through your clothing. So that's only 2% of that sunlight. So even at UPF 50, you're blocking out a huge amount of that light and it's not touching your skin. The great thing is, as Abby said, women are being recognized as kind of this um, source of incoming um, fishing and supplies and things. So there are a lot more options now for this S, uh, UPF clothing and we don't have to try and cram into shirts that aren't necessarily cut for us. So you have a lot more options now and there are even options that are specifically for fishing. So you get that benefit of blocking out the sunlight, but it is also still lightweight and breathable and very um, easy to layer. <clears throat> Another option is sun sleeves. And these are pieces of UPF fabric that literally just go from like your wrist up to maybe mid arm. And those are really helpful if you're just wearing a t-shirt because you can pull them on and your arms are protected, your skin is covered. But if you then move to a shady spot or you're just getting too warm, you can easily take those off without having to roll up a sleeve or change your shirt. Sun gloves are another option and I'll admit that I use these when I drive because I don't like the sun to touch the back of my hands. Uh, they're basically just fingerless gloves and it just offers one more piece of protection because if you think about it, if you have a big hat, that's great, but you're going to be out fasting and your hands are going to be exposed and out there in the sun, um, you can get burned. Hats are perfect for creating your little shady spot. I would go for the biggest brim that you can get. Um, the fishing hats specifically do have longer brims and that not only keeps the sun out of your eyes, but also makes it um, easier for you to see. And you can get uh, some of these sun hats that have longer portions in the back and that can help cover your neck. <clears throat> so the hat's protecting you from the sun above, but the neck gaiters can help protect you from that reflected light. So I'm sure you've seen the net gaiters, especially now with the pandemic. Um, they just pull up and you can bring them up over your face as well. So that way your entire neck is covered. Um, you can cover parts of your face if you'd like to. And I like them because they can also add another layer for when you're actually moving in the boat and it starts to get windy and chilly. Sunglasses, again, just protecting your eyes. But if you get the polarized lenses, you also have the benefit of being able to see better because it's gonna cut out that glare and allow you to see into the water better than you would with unpolarized lenses. And finally, my most important tool uh, for sun protection is just sunscreen. And I do tend to use two different kinds, one for my face and one for the rest of my body because again, I have sensitive skin and some of the body ones are just kind of greasy and I don't really want to put that on my face. Um, <clears throat> I could seriously go on about sunscreen for a long time. So if anybody has any questions or like wants recommendations, you can tailor as much as you want. There's sunscreen for your face um, if you're more oily or if you tend to have dry skin. There's different types based on ingredients. So find a sunscreen that works for you and be sure to reapply it. It's not gonna be good for the entire day. It will eventually wear down and um, not be as effective. So just be sure to reapply and consider the water resistant types because your hands are gonna be in the water, um, you might get splashed. So you just wanna keep that on you for as long as possible and reapplying and using that water resistant will help you do that.
All right, thanks, Claire. Um, my name's Nicole, and I thought it would be fun to follow up the whole year section with a personal and probably relatable story. Um, obviously, you need to tailor your gear for whatever weather you are fishing in, and one of the hardest seasons for that is in the winter. And some people really just enjoy fishing in the summer. Fishing reminds me of the summer, of summer break. Um, but there are a ton of fishing opportunities in the colder months in Nevada. So this is me at Pyramid Lake. I was in college in Reno. So this is about five years ago, um, my first time fishing in cold weather. And Pyramid is a very interesting place. In the first place, you fish on ladders, you're in the water, you're wearing waders. Um, it's cold, it's windy, it could be snowing. Um, and I had never done it before. So, and I'm from Las Vegas, so I, I just didn't have a lot of cold weather clothes. So you can probably not tell that much, but that is not a happy look on my face. I was not <laughs> comfy. I was pretty miserable. I was trying to be tough. Um, but I remember I like, I got in the truck and held my hands in front of the heater for 30 minutes afterwards because I thought my fingers were going to fall off. Um, but that's okay. That was my first time. It happened. Um, you can go to the next slide, Abby. This is my most recent time fishing in cold weather and I have a big smile on my face. Um, that's because it had been five years and I figured some stuff out um, after um, just experiences. And so my first tip on this is to test your gear. So Claire just went over a lot of good gear options um, and you can buy all this stuff and bring it out on your first time but it might still not go as planned on your first time because you haven't used it before. So in this picture, I have on all of my layers that I have tested now over five years time. So I've been on camping trips with these. I've gone fishing. I've been on other trips just wearing these clothes. So I knew exactly how my layers would work in this situation. And this was an even colder situation. This is ice fishing at Wild Horse Reservoir in Elko County. So this was an even colder situation, but I was so much happier. So that's my first tip is to test your gear. Claire went over layers, always bring more than you think. Um, and then not just gear, like clothing gear, but you can see I was also very happy because I was in a tent and I had a little heater buddy next to me and that's good gear too. Sometimes you have to really take advantage um, of your resources and make sure that you're comfortable because when you're comfortable, you have so much more fun. So also think about those accessory type of gear. Um, my second point would be to find a mentor. And I know that can be super hard, um, especially if you're, you don't know people in your family who fish. So, and I know Abby will agree with this. Sometimes you don't have to know the mentor. There are so many YouTube videos now. You don't have to personally know someone to take you fishing. If you watch YouTube videos, if you start watching all of our videos, um, you can have kind of like a pen pal mentor, maybe someone who's not with you fishing, but they could teach you from afar. And um, with that, don't be afraid to ask questions. Now you guys know you can ask all of us questions. Um, and I don't know, I, I've, I used to be embarrassed to ask questions. Like when I went fishing for the first time at Pyramid Lake and I didn't really know what to wear, I was like, well, I'll just figure it out. And I kind of paid for it because <laughs> it was so cold. Um, so I would say always ask questions. And then to sum that up, don't let one bad experience deter you. Because after my first freezing cold, what I thought was a failure, I was like, oh no, I do not fish in the cold. I'm not a cold weather fisherman. Like I don't do that. Um, but it turns out I do. I just took a little bit of time and learning and experience. So um, that's just my personal story about growth as a woman who fish who fishes and I bet Abby and Claire can both relate to this. Um, it just it's just like anything really it's just like anything that you learn to do so if you need tips on um, gear or you have any other questions you have us three. My unmute button does want to come up. Thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. So just like Zoom, we've been doing this for a year and I still can't get my unmute button to work sometimes. 
Um, I, I guess to add on to this too, we'll talk about stuff throughout the presentation, but always, like she said, try it out, do short trips. Um, all of our urban ponds are only 15 minutes away. There are, we actually potentially have snow coming up Wednesday to Thursday night. So Thursday morning, if you wanna test out your cold year, there's your chance. Then you're prepared for next year. This will probably be our last cold front um, we usually have one in March, and then this should be the last one before uh, it warms right up on us. So um, make sure you have the right setup. Um, my daughter, uh, so actually I got to test it out with grandpa in this picture here. And then my daughter came in after she went for a hike with my husband. And um, I, we had set this up just right. A garlic power egg ended up being what the trout really wanted. And every time the kids cast out, um, just using a basic push button spin cast reel, they were able to bring one in. So, um, and this was up at Eagle Valley. This is one of our best trips, I'd say. Um, and this was, you can tell she's wearing a cardigan. So it was just slightly cold. I'd say this was probably around spring break, actually. All right, so there's lots of real options. And when we go to the store, sometimes it can be overwhelming. And sometimes the guys we run into at the store that wanna help us out only know what they know. So it's always known to kind, to kind of find out more. Um, So you want to be comfortable. So um, this one's just the rod. So you can actually just buy the rod. Sometimes it's easier now to even buy the reel separate. So you get whatever rod's comfortable for you, um, depending on the weight of it. Sometimes just a smaller, shorter one um, is best with the push button. If you don't go out a lot, you can throw a lure. You can do power bait all with the push button literally push a button, cast it out, leave it out, or cast it out and reel it in. And then you just wanna kind of give it some motion, which we'll go over in a minute. Um, so this fishing rod uh, with a nice comfortable cork handle, it's a little softer. Um, and I actually kind of like it because it, especially out here, um, it, if it gets wet, it kind of dries a little easier. The last two here, let me try to get the spotlight to work again. Keeps going out on me. Oh, I'm off. okay, so I have to do it over here. Um, so these last two, the handles can actually absorb and stay wet. And so that's kind of not very comfortable when you're out too much. Um, also the spin cast here, you have to open the bale to cast out. So that can be a little bit more, uh, but the action that you get with a spin cast is a little better with worms and plastics and spin baits like this one too. We'll get into more details. Try to stay on the line too. All right. So the main ones are gonna be a spin cast reel, which is the closed faced one. Then you have the spinning reel, which is the open faced one. Sometimes that's all they're called. And then you have a fly reel. Definitely has to go with a fly rod and we'll show that. Claire's going to show that part. And then the bait caster. And this one is if you go fishing all the time, you're on a boat, you're mainly going for bass um, or ocean fishing. So that would be when you want a bait cast type reel. The other two, if you're just going out real quick, you don't go out a lot, I recommend the spin cast or spinning depending on how you grew up too. You know that definitely affects, affects it. And then the line goes with what you're doing. So we have monofilament, which is the most common. Fluorocarbon is either used as a leader, which is the end of the line, or you add it to your braided line. And those are when you're going after bigger fish, deeper waters, so the Colorado River sometimes gets down to 150 to 200 feet. Um, those would be good waters. If you're going pretty deep, you might catch that monster fish. You want fluorocarbon and braid combination. Um, monofilament works great for everything else. And actually, the I think it's a brown trout that was just caught up north. 
in Montana was caught on a four pound line. So it is possible, you just have to be really patient and don't try to manhandle it. So the benefit to being a lady, we don't pull as hard as some of the guys do. So we're not gonna have as many fish break off. And that's the braid and then that's the one here in the middle, right here in the middle. Um, and then this is also a braid and then monofilament and or fluorocarbon, sorry. And then colored line. <laughs> and then wire and leader, you can either buy them separate or you can make them out of the line. Um, so the wire is really neat because that is for something like pike or walleye where you have to worry about teeth and they're breaking that line off on you. So then you would get a wire leader and you just buy it um, usually in a five pack and then you just add it on with a swivel and I will, um, when Claire talks, I'll run out and grab my swivels. I leave my tackle box in the car and I pretty much have everything I need in one little kit. And we, we can squeeze it in. So then here is Claire's section. All right, so fly fishing can be a little intimidating at first. Um, there's a lot to it and there's like 50 different pieces that can all be customized and specialized. So as Nicole said, um, I do recommend getting a mentor. My brother is super into fly fishing and basically would drag me out. So he had company and then I kind of got into it. Um, so just kind of like as a basic diagram here, um, this is kind of what the general setup is gonna be. Now with fly fishing, the focus is more of this like delicate presentation and Abby will go into presentations later. And you can fish a little bit under the water, um, but typically what you're doing is you're casting, or not casting out, but you're tossing out a fly to sit on the top of the water and entice those fish. So what we have is a rod and reel set. And your fly rod is going to be a lot lighter than the other rods would be that Abby had talked about. Um, and connected to your reel, is the backing line. And this is kind of like the bulk of the fishing line. And again, that one's connected directly to the reel. Then your backing, which is part of the line, connected to your fly line. And the fly line is typically brightly colored so that you're able to see it. And you will see uh, different weights. And there's also the weights within the rod and the reel and your leader. And this just goes all back to matching the type of fish in the location that you're fishing to your equipment. So without having to dig around and really figure out what will work for what, if you're just doing general fishing, um, I'd say the six weight rod and reel is a good start and that five weight fly line would be fine too. Now with your fly line, there are different styles and just like a, a nice general one, is um, your weight forward line. And what that means is the part of the fly line that connects to the leader is going to be wider. That line is going to be thicker than where it connects to the backing. And that's important because in fly fishing, the weight of this line, its own weight is what's pulling it out when you cast. So uh, with the previous styles that were mentioned, you have the, the lure and you might have weights on the end. And when you cast, those are being pulled out and that weight is pulling it. But in fly fishing, the line weight itself is what's pulling it. Now you connect the fly line to a leader. And the reason for this leader is that it distances your fly from that fly line. Now remember that fly line is gonna be brightly colored. So your leader is gonna be thinner and it's almost invisible to fish. So they're not gonna see that the fly sitting at the end of it is connected to that bright fly line. Now the tippet, um, I'd say not really necessary in all situations. You could certainly connect your fly directly to the leader, um, but that tippet is just gonna be even further thin, thin line that is going to add more distance between your fly and the fly line. So again, we really just want to match all these weights together. Um, and that will help you have this kind of like balanced setup. 
And finally, you need a fly on the end of your line. And there are many, 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 many different types of flies, all different hook sizes. So again, you're gonna match this to whatever type of fish you're trying to catch. Now, instead of using um, live bait or large lures, you're gonna have these smaller flies. So some kind of just general broad flies that would work for lots of different things would be the woolly bugger, which is that top left one, the nymph, and typically nymphs are fished um, under the surface of the water, and the clouser minnow. So these will be great options if you're just going out to do general fishing. But again, fly fishing can get very um, nuanced and you can really tailor every single piece of this to what you're doing and what you're fishing. Thanks, Claire. All right, so to answer a question we had, um, what line should we choose? There's different pound weights and I never know exactly when I need to use it. So definitely, so I would, so this kind of goes with knowing your water and that'll come in after the knots here in a second. So you wanna know your water, you wanna know what fish you're, fish you're going to catch. Um, the guy up north that just set the record trout, uh, yeah, it's got to be a brown trout. It was pretty neat. Um, I think it was 40 pounds. He managed to bring it down on a four line, four weight line, and I don't know how. Um, so um, you definitely want to know what fish you're catching. Uh, so let me make this closer. So here's a box. This is the fluorocarbon clear. Um, I did get fluorocarbon and this is for the bass spinning reels. So the plan for this line is to catch bass or crappie, warm water species um, up in the Overton arm and we're not going to catch anything bigger than 10 pounds. Uh, also, this can be used. So my husband's new goal is um, some of the local lures. These guys are making some amazing swim baits and they're catching 20 to 30 pound stripers down on Mojave. So what they're getting is they're getting 20 to 50 pound braided line. That way they have that strength and that's just like the backing on the fly line. And actually I should probably go We'll go with that so you guys can kind of piece it together in your mind too. And then they're taking the fluorocarbon as a leader and then they're doing this as a 20 pound leader. So they just add this on to the braided line and then that way, like Claire was saying, they fish don't see that clear line. There are some really cool diagrams. I didn't squeeze it into this PowerPoint, but we'll definitely talk about it when we talk about different fish species again. Oh, and we do have some of those recorded as well. Different fish diff swim at different levels in the water. So they're going to see different light also. Most of our water is green, so you can definitely use like a green tinted line. There's this one by Zebco that's called um, Cajun because all that water is green and murky um, and it's slightly tinted green. And so it actually absorbs some of that uh, clear glare too that the regular line something bright and white is going to be a little bit shinier in the water than a green line in our green water. And I also have a leader. Um, also, as you're watching, if you're on a laptop or a computer, you can move our windows to the and make the presentation a little bit smaller. Um, that way you can see these pictures a little bit better. Um, and then the leader, like Claire was saying too, you can just buy the leader as is, and this one is nine, nine feet, yes, nine feet and tapered. The benefit of the taper is like she's saying, it is really thin on the end. You can tie your fly right to it. Um, they also mark it. So this one is a two X and they're listed on the bottom. That'll go with about a three, um, three weight line or pole. And then these are pretty cool 
they actually tell you how to tie it onto the line as well, or how to tie your fly onto the line. And that, um, if you make a loop on the end of the line, it gives your lure more action. All right, we have a lot of information to cover. <laughs> Sorry, I will, we will keep it to an hour, but we are, it's not gonna be as short as I thought it was gonna be. Um, so these knots, I'm just going to kind of go over them. I highly recommend, recommend animatednots.com, or if you do better with apps, there are, um, there are a couple really good knot apps that will come right up. They're like the first ones. Um, or just, I would type in angling or fisherman's knots, and that is this first one, which is, um, we're going to show in just a second. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Always practice. Even for tonight, um, just so my hands were ready after being on the computer all day, um, my daughter had a lesson right before our meeting tonight. And so I took some fly line and was in the car practicing my knots as well. So I highly recommend practice as much as you can. It just makes it easier when you're out on the water and you can literally bust them out in two seconds. You really only need a few knots and you can go anywhere and do anything. Line can be pretty cheap. This whole reel, which has 1,450 yards, so times that by three, and that'll give you the foot measurement. Um, this reel will do so many, I would say probably 14 fishing poles, and this was only $8. So um, it is harder to find this kind of stuff now, but definitely shop around. Um, what else? Uh, you can trim your line with the nail clippers or wire cutters if you're big into crafting. Also, these are like $6 or $10 maybe for the better ones. They're spring hinged um, and they have wire cutters right in the middle. It also has a little hook and these are angling pliers. So there is, I'm trying to put it in my face so you guys can kind of see it. There's a little lip right there and that can actually hold the fish up for you. And then you have the wire cutter, and then you also um, um, have the grip, so you can smash down uh, the barbs if you don't necessarily want to worry about it getting cut on stuff. And this actually has a screwdriver and everything else on it, too. Uh, a trick to have a better knot that's not going to slip on you is actually to wet it. So as you're doing your knot, if you Lick your lips, put it on your lips real quick, and then tie it, you're good to go. Um, don't use alcohol. Whatever you do, alcohol will practically burn your line. It just rips right into it and fries it. Um, you can use a water-based silicone like you would for um, the track of like a window or a door. Uh, we use it on our fly line too. So um, I do recommend um, if you're not familiar with which ones, you definitely don't want like something corrosive like an automotive one, um, but any of that kind of moisture would be good for the line. Uh, and then to prevent snagging, we're always going to get snagged out here. The uh, best trick is uh, not to have your hook totally flailing out and to make sure your extra lines not cut too much. That'll, um, we'll start making more little videos for that too. Um, so once you find that perfect rig that you're really happy with, that setup is a rig, uh, take a picture of it. That way you're ready to go. You can, just like on Pinterest, we save it for later, uh, have that ready, that picture ready for um, your mental notebook for later. That includes weights, um, certain bobbers, or um, your favorite lure. So it's really nice actually when we're doing the fishing report too and somebody shows us what lure caught that fish because then we know for you guys too if you call us looking for it and they took a picture, they usually have their fishing pole, they have the lure and they have um, if they used any other tackle on the line. So this improved clinch knot, there we go. Uh, Berkeley is one of the fishing line, uh, big fishing line producers. 
Uh, they have these videos on YouTube uh, through their website too. And it shows you exactly how to do the improved clinch knot, which is also the fisherman's knot, or some people call it a cinch knot because you're literally just cinching down the line. And this one comes with a really cool trick um, or they have some tools now that they sell where you can put the hook on the outside and twist it. And so all you have to do is twist the hook and then you pull that line through, just like in the picture here. And so four or five times is good. You don't wanna to do too much or too little. It won't hold or it can actually break down the line if you tie it too many times. And then you cut right near there and you're good to go. So that's the basic fishing knot, and we do have that video uploaded as well. And then the next one is the polymer knot. This one is awesome. Uh, they have some, uh, I think it's called the San Diego Jam, uh, and they've created, taken the polymer knot and just added one more loop, and that's pretty much a San Diego Jam, which catches the 50, 200 pound, well, two, the 300 pound tunas um, and all the yellowtail fish off of San Diego. So this one is you actually just put the loop through. So you double it through the eye. So you can't do it on a really small hook, but you can do it on most one or twos, which is what we're gonna use at Lake Mead. You literally take a bow knot and loop it around your hook and that's it. So it doubles it up. And because it's doubled up and you have a knot on top of a knot, it can hold up to 20 pounds. All right, so we've gone through gear and equipment and knots, and now we're gonna find those fish. So know your body of water. Fishing out at Lake Mead is gonna be completely different than one of our community fishing ponds, like Floyd Lamb, um, or if you're up north fishing the Truckee, or one of our mountain streams out of Elko versus um, Lemoyne, or sorry, um, South Fork is up north. And then I know we have some awesome um, ponds right outside Reno. All those are gonna be completely different. So you can actually even check state records and that'll show you the max size fish in that water. And those are also gonna be the rare ones. And what we stock, so if it's a stocked pond, they're only around a pound. Even the catfish are only around a pound, maybe two at towards the end of the summer. So a lake is gonna be different than a river because you have still water versus moving water. And then brackish water, which is brown. And right now um, I'd compare that to our muddy waters. Perch um, is kind of turned a little bit, uh, the freezing, of the ponds kind of like started up a little bit um, of those reservoirs. So that's a little bit more brackish. And then yeah, we, we have a lot of fresh water. So it all depends, fresh water versus salt water and all that stuff too. Um, so it's also gonna be what the fish are seeing. And it's also gonna be what the fish are eating. So if it's clear, the, their food source is usually a little lighter in color. If it's stained and whatever that color of the sand is, those macroinvertebrates, the insects that their fish are eating are gonna be that tan muddy color too, because they're gonna blend in. Um, again, like I said, we have a lot of green water out here. And I don't know if anyone else has noticed the crawdads or crayfish out at Lake Mead are actually green. They blend right in with the algae on the rocks versus the red ones that we all see on the table or tanned brown ones that are kind of Midwest style. Um, so fish are gonna be found, shall, can be found shallower or near coves when it's muddy or stained. So the darker water, they don't have to hide as deep to feel safe. So you can actually find them up in coves um, you could actually find them hiding right here because they think that they're blending in well. Um, so you definitely want to creep up on the area and do some research. Um, this dark spot right here would be a great fish hiding hole. And again, back to YouTube, we watch a lot of YouTube in our house too. 
um, there's some really cool videos of places where they're allowed to fish in channels. Um, up north, there are some of those places, some other states around us. Uh, wetlands, we are not allowed to fish it for multiple reasons, for safety of health, and just so you don't fall in um, that water, it's pretty fast moving. So um, there is no fishing in the wetlands park out here, but there are um, like the Lake Mead government wash area. Uh, once you're in the park, that's legal fishing. And there's some really great places like this along there too. So when it's clear, they're gonna be way deeper. So uh, they do notice all the light coming in. And so they're gonna hide near the brush and way uh, further down. So like Lake Mojave, they're pretty deep. Um, they're also gonna be hiding right outside the bugs that they're eating. So all the hatch are gonna be emerging from these areas here. So for fly fishing, you're gonna match the hatch and that's why Claire was talking about the nymphs. Um, as they emerge up, the fish are gonna chase them. And if you can get your fly in those waters and in that area, you're gonna have way more success. Um, you want to, if you're doing an imitator, which uh, imitates what the fish is eating, you're going to want it to move just like that bug that they're chasing after. Um, if you're doing more of an attractor, you still want to give it some flair, but you also want to make it flash. So the more movement you can give your um, lure, the better. So I want to squeeze in, I said I was going to talk about the um, uh, swivels. I love barrel swivels with the clip. So the barrel swivel is just those two parts there, top bottom, and it's attached to a clip. You put that on your line, you can switch it out. You can put a bobber above it and then have your line to a lure. Or if you have a big enough swivel, you can just put the lure right on there and you can see how it moves right along and twitches through the water. Um, so I think I'm gonna have to break all these presentations down for the future and we'll go over different bodies of water. Um, so fish are all different and it all depends on where they're at. Even at Lake Mead, um, Doug, our boss, has done a few different papers on that too. It's, a total, it's so big and it's so different depending on what cove you're at. So um, some are gonna be 10 feet, some are gonna be 20 feet, and then the plants are totally different. The food source is gonna be totally different. Temperatures are totally different. So then it changes everything. So definitely give yourself time, go out for 30 minutes and test that water throughout this throughout the year. And that way, you know, next year, this time, this is what works. In the summer, it's gonna to be totally different. Um, right now with this storm brewing in, fish and animals hold tight. So when the water's crazy, they're not moving much. So if you can like make something imitate what they're, and get it right in front of their face, hopefully the school's right there, you're gonna have more success. But you're gonna to have to meet that fish at their home because <laughs> they're not moving when the weather's, uh, when the pressure's high. The seasonal movement, and depending on the season, depending on if they're spawning, the fish are gonna act different. This works for bass, bluegill, um, trout, obviously. So as the ice starts melting, then the trout will start going into pre-spawning and then spawning once it warms up and it's clear. Bass right now are spawning, uh, or kind of pre-spawning to spawning. So we're right at that perfect time to um, find them in the shallows. But again, we don't wanna necessarily take them. We wanna make sure that they are creating offspring so that we have something to fish. And then fall and winter, when it's really cold in the deeper water, they're gonna also move up to the shallows. So Lake Mead is great fishing in November, October, November, December. 
before it gets too cold and before you can't handle it on the shoreline, but it is great shore fishing. And you can even see um, the threadfin shad that a lot of the fish feed off of in Lake Mead are also in the shallows and you can pretty much catch them from shore. So this is a kind of fun one and feel free to jump in on the chat. Um, so where do we think the fish are hiding? It kind of gives you a few little tricks and tips and ideas. So one place is, there we go, right off the edge of, edge of points. So just like in Nemo, they don't want to move out too far into the open, but these points are great because it kind of gives them that sense of safety right along the edge. And then the coves are the same thing. So you're going to have the cove, you're going to have the point to the open water. So depending on how shallow the cove is, they could be spread all the way through or they could be along the edges of those coves. And depending on the brush. Channels. Um, so you can almost look at some of the waters and there's some spots at Floyd Lamb too where you can see a channel. It just goes light to dark to light. And that's right where you want to fish. You don't want to Try to get your bait in line all the way out there. Um, you want to actually kind of gauge it and get it right down the middle and hit those channels and beds will be right in that channel. And drop-offs are great places to find fish. Um, again, just like in Nemo, they don't have to go all the way out. They can kind of see that it's deep out there, but they're still feeling that sense of safety along the edge. And any structure, saddles or humps, um, so sometimes you're not going to have a channel, you're going to have actually more like a, an island or a berm. So right along that edge is going to create a drop off. So that's when you're looking at the saddles and humps. So here's another really cool picture of the fish could be hiding along the rocks and feel free to jump out any of your ideas too. Where's your favorite place? Um, once it gets towards summer, you can even see some fish under the Hemingway Fishing Pier, something like this, a floating island or a dead tree. You can see the sh shadows right here, creating a sense of safety. Um, under the, um, there's a great book called The Pond. Fish food are hiding under all these lily pads. So any of the uh, plants are going to give um, a great food source, and then the fish are going to be right along in all these edges. And then you can see a channel here, right, for E. And um, also the shadows created from these trees also create a sense of security for the fish right along this whole edge. So you don't want to leave that one in. All right, so you can see the fish hiding in the brush. So the vegetation there, definitely a great place. And this is when you want to use that bass rig, oh, sometimes Ned rigs, and it all depends on how um, the movement that you're using and the hooks that you're using to get to the fish in those areas without getting tangled up. Fish love hiding along logs. Their food's also hiding underneath there or smaller fish are hiding underneath. Boat docks, like I said, creates the shadows. And stumps are usually those dead trees. All right, so what are these examples of? What do you think the fish are using to for cover? Here. Yes, definitely. And what's pretty neat is this top picture, this trout here, this is exactly how they create their reds, which is the fish version of a nest. So their red is gonna be just a brushed out pile of rocks and it looks just like an underwater nest. And they hide their eggs in the place just like that. Sometimes you can even see it from shore. And then these 
plants here. So sometimes what's really neat um, is you can see the plant kind of emerging from the water, like in that little cartoon picture, and the fish are gonna be right there. So you're just gonna wanna cast right outside those plants and entice that fish to come out to your lure, bait, or whatever you have on your hook. So honestly, sometimes it is all about the presentation. Uh, I'd say 90% of the time, it's the presentation, not what you're throwing. You want to entice the fish. These swim baits look like a small fish. And if you wiggle it just right, it's gonna look like the fish that they've been chasing all day. But you need to make sure it looks like that fish. Um, it's called jigging or twitching. So jigging is more that longer motion. And then twitching is just more like sideways. Let me try to get some examples for you. I can't remember the name. So um, we're gonna go on to it, but I'll throw it out there too. So you can literally present this fish like this and just leave it kind of limp like a dead fish or you can wiggle it through the water and make it look like a swimming fish. But you definitely wanna look at your water and make it as realistic as possible. Um, and then that's that jerking or sweeping. So sweeping it along the edge of the plant um, and make it look just like what they're chasing. So you can present it horizontally or vertically. And as long as it's, um, gives the motion that they're looking at and what they think they want. Um, that, that's pretty much what it's all about and finding them. So depending on the mood that they're in, if they're in the pre-spawning motion, then they're gonna be hungry. If they're spawning, it's more about defense and protecting their eggs. So they're gonna be angry. So that's why sometimes, um, Here's a crankbait, crawdad crankbait, and it has a long, a deeper lip there. Um, so you want to get this down in the water and wiggle it across just above the bottom of the water. So when you cast it out, you don't want to necessarily be able to see it in most of our waters because our waters aren't that clear that we're fishing around here. So you want to make sure it drops down low enough and then you would slowly wiggle it in. You also want to be careful that you don't get it snagged in the rocks because you have two hooks on here, which is the limit. You can have two hooks, not three, per line. Um, so here's a crankbait spinner bait, which is the bass one. And umbrella rig, you can only have two hooks on it, but the other ones are going to be decoys. And so that brings them in thinking that they're going after a school of fish. And if so speed that is you're casting at is not working, very change it up. Most of the time I catch something, it's when I'm not paying attention and who knows what my hand's doing. So I always say it's because I my hand's kind of like this by the time I'm like talking to somebody else or I'm paying attention to a bird over here. Um, my I end up kind of jigging it and jerking it along. Um, so then you can do all of these as a vertical presentation. And that's when we go into um, like a worm off the bottom. There you go. So um, the guys that are using the worms, for bass, but they work for everything. So when it is kind of out of order, so this guy here, you could do as a dead stick and just kind of leave it there. You can either troll or go really, really slow and then kind of just barely jerk it in. Um, and then it's just gonna kind of shake along the bottom. Another worm option, which also awesome is you can leave the hook in and I don't have to worry about poking my finger on the other side, but the when a bass goes after it, it's going to hit so hard, it'll break through the worm and uh, then it'll hook them in the lip. 
I also use this for uh, practicing out front with the bait caster. Um, you're going to work this and tubes that are on the weighted hooks all about the same, and they're going to be vertical along the bottom. And that's the Texas rig, that's the Ned rig, um, or tubes where you're ice fishing or warm water fishing, but you're kind of going slow and you're just shaking it along the bottom of the rocks and the ground. Okay, so hopefully you can now find the fish. Let me know if you can't. Uh, we'll help you however we can. And if I didn't answer a question, please let us know. Now we're going to make sure you're prepared. Um, so this is one of our awesome families that goes out to Lake Mead all the time. This is one of their pictures from the fall, three generations. They always go out all together. Um, there's two little girls. One of them we've used for some of our other pop publications too because they're adorable and they always wear their life jacket. Um, make sure you're fishing responsibly. The fishing license pays for the stocked fish. It also pays for the water maintenance to be, um, so that we can do the water sampling. Um, it also pays for um, boater safety while you're out and about. Um, so know your restrictions, pays for those fishing guides, uh, know your waters. Um, and then we're going to respect the water. So um, this is all part of the ethical angler rules and it's just being a safe angler. And I always said uh, when social distancing came out, I was like, they were always talking about anglers because we're always social distancing because we don't want to get our line tangled up with our neighbor. So um, if you're out on the water and you see some garbage, make sure you use that extra garbage bag that you brought with you. Um, you don't need to leave it. You want your fish healthy. So if you can help pack it out, that's going to be better for everyone, including yourself. Uh, let them go and grow. And that's where I was kind of saying, we know that the bass are spawning right now. We know that they're on their nest. Um, the trout will be on their nest in a couple months. But if we don't let them stay in the water and protect their eggs and spawn um, their species, then we're not going to have any fish to catch later. Also, leaving those little ones in there to get bigger and going after like the medium sized ones, that's always really good too. And selective harvesting is only eating what you're real, only keeping what you're really going to eat. Um, but if it dies, you do have to keep it. You can't put back the dead fish. Uh, preserve your passion. And that's why I love this picture. Protect your legacy and spread the word. They're always taking friends and family out. They're, um, they're getting their little girls loving life on the water. And um, that's their weekend. Um, so always plan it, uh, preserve your passion, know what you're getting into and share it with others. Um, we have some really great groups. Please email me. Um, it's A Zarnecki, my first initial last name, A Zarnecki at endow.com. I just saw a comment come in, so I just wanted to answer before you got to go. Uh, there's a lot of women anglers um, online, honestly, um, so let me know, and I will thank you, Nicole. It's in my email in the chat, so you can copy it there. I will definitely get you in contact with some girls out here. Um, there's a few ladies, actually, they're <laughs> named Lori, and they both they all go fishing and they're always looking for friends. Um, we have Trout Unlimited throughout the state. Uh, we also have bass clubs, striper clubs, all have female anglers. Um, so definitely, and hopefully I'll be teaching live sessions soon and we'll get the ladies together to go fishing too. So uh, we went and made fishing, getting your fishing license easy, even if you're new, you can start it online. You would just start a new account. If you have ever had a fishing license, you are in the system. We did transfer everything over when we went online. So you literally just go to endowlicensing.com and you can get your license even on the water. Say you 
drove all the way out there and you forgot to get your fishing license, better safe than sorry, find the cell service, get your fishing license, and then that way it's on your phone, screenshot it, save it, download it, whatever you, whatever's easiest for you, and um, make sure you're prepared to show the game warden. And if you need help doing any of that, let us know too. So here's the contact information. If there are any other questions, let us know. And there is also an exit survey as soon as you close out of here, uh, that will pop up. Please let us know what else you want to hear about. I would be more than happy to do a specific kind of class. Um, you could even go to your water if you have cell service. I can go to a water nearby. That way we're not all in the same area and we can do a virtual class in our, on our own shores. If you have any questions about specific baits, lures, lines, fishing poles, I do have everything around me. You can kind of see them popping up back here too. I have all the examples for you tonight. So let us know what questions you have. If you want to unmute yourself, let us know. And thank you all for coming. Thanks to my awesome co-host tonight. And then hopefully we'll see you on the next ones. Oh, I do want to give, someone brought up that they had kids too. One of the best things I think we found for groups that come out with multiple kids and you're bringing that one, three, five, four or five-year-old that's really new to casting, let them cast. But put on a swim bait or, which is, um, where's the other one without the hook? These are one of those minnow kits. And so there is no hook on it. Um, you can just put it right on the swivel. And so they can cast this fish over and over and over again and be so happy because they think they're catching a fish every single time. And then you can work with the older kids or you can practice your casting. You can do this in the front yard. It doesn't get tangled up in the trees, I promise. If you do get tangled up in the trees, make sure you always pull straight back. Um, that actually can usually um, either bend the hook out, so you may lose the hook, but it'll pull straight back. You'll be able to um, get out of your tangle the best. It's usually what I do when we do our fishing field trips. Definitely recommend all that. You can clean up some of your rusty gear too. Um, it definitely polishes right up with a little borax. Works really good or just that steel brush. Um, I know some of my favorite memories too is fishing with my um, best friend's dad's tackle box or grandpa's actually, her grandpa's tackle box from the 40s, 50s, the one that she grew up with. And we go out to call, when I go out to Colorado to visit her too, we use his gear. But thank you all. This will be recorded and is on our YouTube channel, Nevada Department of Wildlife. And um, we're going to get it all sorted by uh, wildlife or fishing or hunting. So you'll be able to find everything even easier. But if you have any other questions, a lot of it's on there already, too. Thank you all for joining. Have a very good night.